Okay. Okay, you should be getting the email and we'll right. go ahead and resume our our feed. Nope. We can start talking. Let's when Mr. Direct gives us the thumbs up. We're back. Okay. All right. Good evening. Sorry about the delay. We're going to resume. Um, and I'd like to introduce Sarah Burkhead. And she's with us from the Virginia Department of Health. And we want to give your um, information. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Burkhead. And I am the Regional Coordinator for Tobacco Control with Virginia Department of Health. So we work on tobacco policies like tobacco free campuses. Um, and then we work on tobacco and nicotine cessation and prevention efforts as well. Um, and I do apologize for the delay, but I am really happy to be with you today. And I'm really glad that there's online folks and that this will be recorded um, because talking to parents and educators and concerned adults, I think is the number one thing we need to be doing when it comes to youth vaping um, nicotine products. Um, so we're still trying to pull up my presentation, um, but what I want to, to start out talking about with you all um, is why we care about nicotine. So obviously you all came out tonight or you're watching this, um, but sometimes I've heard from parents like it's just nicotine or um, I'd rather that than some other product. Um, and so what I hope you, you listen and what you take home today is why we are concerned about nicotine in any form and how to have conversations with young people um, compassionately and, and open-ended conversations um, that really open up that conversation um, where young people can talk to us about it and, and tell us what they know and, and how they feel about it. Um, and so I'd like to start, you know, I think that uh, as adults, you know, we want to give our young people tools um, so that when they're out on the road, they make good choices, right? They're safe. Um, they know how to get where they're going and, and they choose the right path. Um, and so having these conversations will help them have those tools. So when they're out on the road, um, when they're out there in, in real life, um, they'll remember what you're talking to them about and, and help them make better choices. Um, and I was really touched by this article that I read recently. It was actually in a, in a Cincinnati newspaper. Um, but they started out and they really described what this 17 year old was going through who, who was trying to quit vaping. And so this is when I, when people ask me, why do we care about nicotine? I, I want you just to kind of take a moment and hear this story. For every puff of vape she inhales, 17-year-old MJ says she is rewarded one minute of relief. The anxiety that consumes her on a daily basis evaporates in that one minute, replaced by a blue raspberry haze she has grown dependent on. She walks through her school hallways in this haze, though she knows vaping is bad for her health. Four years into inhaling vape juice, she's living with the consequences. She can't run for more than 10 seconds without having trouble breathing. There's a feeling in her lungs, she says, an intense squeezing sensation after she vapes. She gets migraines. Her throat is always dry. She's lost weight. She suffers from insomnia and a loss of appetite. And those feelings of anxiety and depression come back after the 60 seconds are up. So she'll take another hit and another. So that's a 17 year old who had been vaping for four years and was really experiencing a lot of those um, side effects and symptoms that have come from her vaping. Um, and so nicotine itself, why do we care about nicotine? Nicotine in any form is a concern. So nicotine can harm the growing adolescent brain. Using nicotine in adolescence can harm the parts of the brain that control attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. 
and using nicotine in adolescents while that brain is still growing till about age 25 um, may also increase risk for future addiction to other drugs. So why do we care about nicotine? Because we care about our young people. Just keep looking to see if my presentation is there, but it's, it's okay. Okay, great. Um, and I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page when we're talking about uh, the language around vaping and e-cigarettes. Um, the tobacco landscape is evolving. Okay, we're on the third slide. Thank you. Um, the tobacco landscape is evolving. Um, there have been a lot of different products and our language hasn't really caught up with us in a sense. So we talk about tobacco from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration definition of tobacco products. Um, and that includes all different types of tobacco and nicotine. It also includes synthetic nicotine. And so all of those products are tobacco. But if you ask a young person, like, do you use tobacco and they vape, they're probably going to say, no, I don't use tobacco, even though it's all under this umbrella term. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll use uh, e-cigarettes and vapes interchangeably a lot tonight. Um, e-cigarettes tend to be the name of the product and vape can be a verb. So if you're vaping, but it also can be the product. Um, and then if you use a jewel, you might not say you vape because jewel became a verb, but jewel is a type of e-cigarette. Puff bar is a type of e-cigarette. So at any point tonight, if I'm using um a term that I haven't already defined, please just raise your hand. It can be a little bit complicated because there's so many different cigarette and vaping products. But what they have in common is rather than a lit product, like a cigarette um, is lit, it's combustible. These are all heated. So these are products heated by a battery um, of, and they have liquid nicotine. The nicotine is derived from a tobacco plant unless it's synthetic nicotine, which is um, been designed in a lab, but it has that same components of nicotine. Um, and then that's heated and it's inhaled and it's actually an aerosol. So it's not water vapor. Even when you hear that term, it sounds like something off of a tea kettle, right? Like just something um, innocent, but it's actually more of an aerosol like hairspray. The next slide, please. Um, and so what the studies have shown with what is in that aerosol is that there is fine particulate matter, uh, volatile organic compounds, nicotine can be found in that aerosol. Um, there's cancer causing chemicals, heavy metals, um, and flavoring such as diacetyl, which is a chemical linked to lung disease. So there's a whole lot that's in that aerosol that is both inhaled into the lungs and then exhaled as well. And there are some things to, to kind of celebrate, you know, when we're talking about tobacco and nicotine. And one is the shift in trends that we have seen lower rates of smoking as we have overall with the general population. Um, but back in 1975, smoking among 12th graders was 37%. And now it's really at an all time low um, of, of 2%. And so that's really something the trends that we've seen but as you can see in that chart, e-cigarettes are still the number one product used by young people today. So I don't expect you to, to really follow this, but what I do want to just show you is that the trends, um, the, you know, the cigarettes, that first blue line has come way down. And then the red line is the e-cigarette rate that really peaked. Um, does anyone know when that peaked? What product became really popular? That's the jewel. So the jewel really changed e-cigarette use, um, which I'll get into a little bit more as we go through some slides. Um, and the reason that this FDA, uh, this is the National uh, Youth Tobacco Survey, and the way it's broken down like that is that the methods changed for collecting the data. Um, COVID obviously impacted collecting data. So they went from paper data to electronic data. Um, so web-based data. So that's why those are, are chunked a little bit. And so they say we can't exactly um, compare, you know, apples to apples. But e-cigarette is still the highest um, used product. And that has come down due to some changes that we'll get into. Um, and it's come down even a little bit more. So the next slide. 
Uh, we just received the data, so I don't have uh, you know, the charts yet, but that the um, latest National Youth Tobacco Survey again shows a decrease, which is, which is good news. Um, we're now seeing about 10% of middle and high school students that report currently using any type of tobacco product. Um, and that decline, which is great even for high school students, and then e-cigarette use declined from 14 to 10%. Um, and so the products, again, similar to that chart, but this is just the, the latest breaking news. E-cigarettes are still the most used product followed by cigarettes at 1.6%. Um, and then, you know, cigars, nicotine pouches, smokeless tobacco, oral nicotine products, hookahs, heated tobacco products, and pipe tobacco, all very low percentages. And so that goes back to that changing landscape of tobacco products, right? There's so many different types that we see. Um, so for those that are using e-cigarettes, what I want to talk about, though, is that they have been showing strong dependence on the nicotine, which means that there's a high rate of daily use for those using and frequent use. So of those students using them, 40% are using e-cigarettes frequently and 30% are reporting daily use, which is not a surprise considering how addictive, especially these newer vape products, actually are. And just to, to bring some statewide data, the Virginia Youth Survey shows that it's about 14% of our Virginia youth are using e-cigarettes. Um, that's still the number one product in Virginia for young people. Um, but this was in 2021, and so they're now doing the next iteration of the Virginia Youth Survey this fall. And so we'll see if that will also be similar trends um, that we're seeing nationwide down to 10%. So uh, is anyone monitoring the chat? Or is, is that a possibility online? Or for those of you in the room, I'd love to see how many vaping devices you see in this picture. Or toss it out. I'll repeat it in the microphone. How many vaping devices do you think you see? For those of you at home, there is a Google form that has a link a link to a Google form, I'm sorry, and you are able to submit questions using that. You can find that link on the calendar on our homepage, PCPS homepage. Um, it is in the calendar. It is also in the announcement for this event. That's great. Or you can just hold up your fingers at home and try to play along. That works great. Anyone? How many do you see? Any number is great. Three? Two. All right, there are actually five. There were five different devices, if you could go to the next slide, please, um, in that picture. But what that picture really uh, speaks to me is that these look like things that you would see, right, on somebody's desk, or you can see when the Jewel became really popular and it looked just like a USB drive, how that went. Yeah, the USB drive, that's how big, you know, the Jewel looks you can see how this went undetected, right? And how easy it is to conceal. These products look like they're water drops, pens, um, you know, any other types of devices that you might see on a desk. And so the next slide shows, these were actually found in Virginia's high schools, um, Eastern Virginia Medical School. Uh, this is one of their pictures, but all of those are vaping devices, including that necklace and the watch. So this is, it's a little hard to stay on top of the products when they're constantly changing and when there's so many different types out there that look like everyday products as well. And so I wanted to just show a, really quickly about how the, the products themselves keep changing. So again, we in public health love our research. And so we're always playing catch up, right? So we find out about the trend and we play catch up to find out what it is. Um, and try to wait and see what the research is showing us. Um, but this is, you can see the jewel again, spiking there in popularity. And when it took that sharp decline, that's because FDA said any pod device. So the jewel has like a, a pod of liquid that goes right on top of it. And I have some things that we can look at for those of you here in person, um, after the presentation, but the jewel has that pod. Those became so popular. They came in so many flavors that FDA said all pod devices had to stop. You couldn't sell flavors. You could only sell tobacco flavor or, or mint. Um, and so dual popularity went down. The pod 
devices started going down because we know youth like flavors. It's not surprising that blue raspberry in the article. Um, but then there was a loophole where it didn't cover flavored disposable baits because those hadn't been popular with young people until they can't get the ones they want. And so all of a sudden, puff bar is the sharp incline, came out of nowhere because people were not getting their jewel flavored pods. Um, and then the other thing I just want to point out is that tiny little green dot. So uh, the elf bar wasn't even on the chart, right, until 2022. And then it became the second most common, and it's still one of the most popular. We'll see some pictures of it here in a second. Um, vape, but that wasn't even on our radar, right, until we find out what young people are using. Um, so the next slide, please. So we constantly are looking at these emerging products. And so what I, the takeaway here is they could look like anything. So it goes back to having those conversations, right, and being able to talk to our young people about these products. Um, the Elf Bar is no longer able to call itself Elf Bar. It's now like EB Bar. There's an SO Bar. There's Mr. Fog. Those are gummies. Those are nicotine gummies. Um, and again, I kept those aren't quite as popular on the far left, but I kept them on this slide because to me, it looks like those drops you put in your water. It looks like a credit card. It just can look like a lot of different products. We're talking about a lot of different products. Next slide. And so I don't have data on the amount of nicotine for all of these hundreds and hundreds of products, but just to give you a sense. So the amount of nicotine in a pack of cigarettes is the equivalent amount of nicotine in one jewel pod. So one of those disposable pods and about the um, equivocal amount of nicotine in one puff bar. What's a little different from using a traditional cigarette is that in most places you have to go outside, um, even if it's not uh, in policy, it's kind of a social norm. You don't see smoking indoors in many places anymore. So you might step outside. So you might not be able to do it all day long. You'd see the physical cigarette, right? Like you see it go down. You may not even finish it. You might put it out. With an e-cigarette, you don't have that same visual. Um, and these these newer devices are really high in nicotine compared to the first devices that came out. So we're talking about nicotine salt vapes um, that changed the pH balance that made it easier to take in a lot of nicotine because nicotine itself is harsh. So there's a lot of chemicals in a traditional cigarette um, that help mask the harshness of nicotine and help someone take it in. And so these nicotine salts in similar way masked the nicotine, changed the pH balance and made it easier to add more nicotine to them and then for someone to take in. Um, but then with a hit on a vape, you may end up taking more of it throughout the day, or you may not even know how much nicotine you're taking in. Um, so again, for that growing adolescent brain, that's a real concern with taking in high amounts of nicotine. And we are seeing this has just started to be on the surveys, so we don't have a lot of great data around youth use. Um, I do know that Zins and Zinnies have become popular on TikTok, um, but these are called nicotine pouches. And so if you've never heard of them or seen them, next time you go to a gas station or grocery store, you will see them. They are very cheap, two for five dollars, buy one, get one free. Um, and then you don't have to spit like a chewing tobacco, you would have to spit with these nicotine salt nicotine pouches. You just put it in at your gum. That nicotine uh, goes in through your gum, but there's no spitting involved. And these are, again, our high amounts of nicotine. Um, they, the Zin and On go up, uh, up to about six or eight milligrams. Um, but this free, one of my Henrico partners told me she's starting to see free in a lot of places. Um, that goes up to 15 milligrams of nicotine. And so I, I wrote my friends at VCU that do research on products. And I'm like, what does this even mean? What is somebody taking in? And they said one of these pouches for on in particular, which is the one that they studied, one of those pouches is about the same as a cigarette. But again, it's very discreet. You put it in your gum. And then some of them even have a little discreet box where you can spit it out. So it makes it really convenient to hide or to not be aware 
of, of how much nicotine they're taking in um, or even knowing that someone is using it. So this is something we're going to keep our eye on um, in terms of youth use. And I, you don't have to read this whole slide, but I wanted you to know this is from the CDC. And so again, it comes back to that question, why do we care about nicotine? And so all, the majority of e-cigarettes do contain nicotine, even some that say 0%. E-juice have been tested and they still have some nicotine in them. Um, and, but nicotine itself is extremely addictive, as I've mentioned, and it can harm that adolescent brain and it harms the attention, learning, mood, impulse control, and can kind of prime that brain for future addiction. So that to me is worth repeating and just reminding people that it's, that nicotine alone is something to care about. And so if you look at it, we know young people are using these products because it probably feels good, right? It releases that, um, uh, the, the chemicals that make you feel good. It actually can help you focus. Um, and so when they smoke, vape, dip, or chew, that nicotine enters your brain. The brain releases dopamine, serotonin, uh, and you feel pleasant, calm, rewarded, focused. So these are positives. And I do want us all to remember that when we're talking to a young person. Um, it's not just a rebellious act. Um, most likely they feel good when they're using it. And so it's important to use that. But then as the chemical levels drop, and that's where the cravings start, um, the withdrawal symptoms trigger those cravings. And then there's uh, feelings of feeling stressed, anxious, irritable, and you can't focus. So this is true also for the addiction cycle in adults. But again, for, for young people, we're especially concerned because of the way their brain isn't developed and they're just, it's easier to get addicted to these products. Um, and to become super focused where then all that they think about doing, the only thing that can help them is more nicotine. Like it kind of focuses their brain on what makes them feel good. And that answer is nicotine, which is why they come back to use that again. And so in the short term, it does help with stress relief, but in the long term, it's actually creating more stress in your body. And so what we're seeing with mental health is that nicotine for those um, young people, and I'm sure you all have seen the statistics that mental health in our society, but especially with our young people, it's really a concern right now. And so for those young people that have anxiety or depression, nicotine worsens those symptoms. Back to that, that addiction cycle that we just saw, that makes sense. Um, but the good news, I don't have a lot of good news with when I'm the guest speaker, you all, but the good news is for those young people that quit, their, their anxiety, their depression, and their stress levels actually improves. So it's, I'm not saying it's easy to get there, but that's what the research is showing us, is that they feel better when they're off the nicotine. And so I did briefly mention the flavors, but I did just want to point this out too, that um, flavors really attract young people. It helps them to you know, get started. And that's true with cigarettes. It's true with e-cigarettes. And of those young people that are using these products, 89.4% said they use flavored products. My guess is it's actually higher. They may not even know that. Um, these products have been marketed to our young people. They used influencers. They used really catchy ad campaigns, even though they said these were marketed to adults to switch from the number one preventable cause of death and disease to an e-cigarette. Um, most recently, these highlighter vapes have come out. They look exactly like a highlighter. Um, and then today, the reason I want to bring this up is just today, FDA um, announced that they have sent warning letters um, out to different companies. Do the next slide too. Um, and the head, the director of FDA's Center for Tobacco Products um, said, as we continue into the school year, it's critical that parents, teachers, and other adults are aware of illegal e-cigarettes deceptively packaged to look like everyday items. These types of products can be easily concealed and contain nicotine, which is highly addictive and can harm the developing adolescent brain, which I know I keep repeating, but it's worth repeating. Um, and so I just wanted, since this came out today in my email, I just wanted you to see a couple of these products. Um, and the, the ones with the red box, those are e-cigarettes. 
and the ones with the other box just tell you what they look like, drink containers. And these are the types of products that are illegally on the market, and FDA is constantly, constantly, constantly trying to take them off the market. So if you go to the next slide, too, they look like toys, you know, those highlighters, they look like drinks. Um, so it's really hard to stay on top of all the different types of vapes that are out there. And then one other thing I just want to mention is wellness vapes. I don't know if you've heard about these, but these people tell me there's no nicotine. It's just, um, it's to help me sleep. It's to help me de-stress. It's to help me focus. Well, the wellness vapes, and there is a whole line of them, and they're very Instagram worthy, all of their ads and things. But the FDA also says that these are, are not advised as wellness or as stress relievers. Um, and any type of inhaled product can be dangerous. And so, you know, even with the flavors, you're not inhaling mango or a blue raspberry. You're inhaling chemicals that are designed to taste like that. And this, you're not, you know, inhaling lavender into your lungs is not a good idea. If someone was saying that they were you know, ducking behind the football stadium to inhale chemicals, we'd be really upset. Or if they said they can't go into the school bathroom without inhaling chemicals, we'd have parents going to the school board, right? Well, these vapes, they are chemicals. They're designed to, to taste like flavors or to, um, you know, pre pretend to be wellness and help you throughout your day. And so it's really important to talk about real wellness that, that you know, the school talks about, that you talk about at home, but things like getting a good night's sleep, meditation, breathing exercises, right? Eating well, moving your body, all of the things that we also already know that can help with stress um, rather than turning to this device. And then I, a couple other outliers. These are just some random things to toss out before we talk about some, some ways you all can have conversations. But I do want to let you know or remind you that all of the public K through 12 schools are comprehensive tobacco free campuses. So that means 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even if someone is using the school property on a weekend, these campuses are, are vape free cigarette free, smokeless tobacco free for anyone, even if you are of legal age. Which brings me to my next slide, that our age to use or to, to purchase or use um, any type of tobacco product did raise from 18 to 21. So I'm finding not a lot of people even know that, um, but that happened in 2019. And that's a preventative initiative um, it is good, the, and again, it's that because of that adolescent brain that's still developing, the longer you can delay use, the less likely you are to be addicted to it. Um, and it is also to help with this rise of e-cigarette use, use um, among our young people. So that's nationwide. Virginia actually did do it first, and then um, along with some other states, and then it went nationwide at the end of 2019. So the big question is what can we do, right? So let's Keep going here. Um, another little bit of positive news. I told you I don't have too much, but this one's good too, which is that we found out that the young people who are using these products want to quit. They're kind of tired of using them. So two thirds of the students, and again, this is that National Youth Tobacco Survey, um, two thirds of those students who are currently using tobacco were seriously thinking about it and 60% had tried to stop. So that's really good. So we want to make sure that we give them tools. Young people don't see themselves as addicted to these products. They think of themselves as invincible. That's not a surprise for anyone that has a teenager or a young person or works with them, right? Um, but these products really are addictive. They keep coming back to them for a reason. Um, so we have a program through the Virginia Department of Health called Live Vape Free VA. Um, and I encourage all of you to go to our website um, and we know that, that teens, uh, don't often call, right? They're more likely to text. And so they don't call. We have a 1-800 quit now, quit line. Young people have never called it, even though our coaches are prepared to talk to anyone 13 and over and they have some different strategies for young people. They don't call. So a young person can text date free VA to 873-373 and it gets them started. So the next slide. Um, and then it helps teens really think about why they want to quit. 
and builds off that motivation. So it might be their, their grades, it might be athletics, it might be they're spending too much money. So the program really focuses on their why, which might be different from their friend's why, um, but really talks, helps them find that and then expand on that motivation to quit. And then there are videos, there's podcasts, there's quizzes, there's all sorts of interactive ways that they learn what is in these products um, and what's the best way for them to stop using them. And so they've, they're given all these little things over text message and then they can text coach at any time to start chatting with a coach. And then the great thing is that Live Vape Free VA also has resources for parents. And so there's a guide that actually breaks it down and talks to you about how to have a conversation with a young person. And this can also be for coaches, um, for guidance counselors, for youth pastors, um, anyone that wants to talk to a young person about vaping. And then you as an adult can even chat with a coach. So you can connect directly from our website to a coaching program to get tips about helping that young person quit. If you yourself use a tobacco product, that's where that 1-800-QUIT-NOW or quitnowvirginia.org uh, can help any adult quit any type of tobacco or nicotine product. But this program helps you help that young person to quit. So these are just examples of some of the resources. Keep going. And then there's just a couple of others. And then I'd love to put these um, you know, on your website to have them too, these resources. But CDC, gov slash vaping has empower vape free youth and this has fact sheets conversation cards and videos again that encourage healthy coping skills and that talk you in through having conversations with young people the next resource is, is from samsa and it's the talk they hear you campaign and this one is really great because it talks about a lot of different substance use and some of those same conversations that you're having are also protective factors for any type of drug or substance. Um, so having those open-ended conversations, especially when you're driving and maybe not looking eye to eye, um, a lot of those are similar um, recommendations. And so this is an app and talking points and really walks adults through talking to young people. So we're, I know we were running a little bit late, so I'm not going to go into this in, a, in detail, but there's a lot of really helpful tips on all of those that we've sort of summarized. But, you know, before, get your facts, um, show empathy, find the right time and place. Um, during the, do you want to just keep clicking? Yeah. During the conversation, um, express your concerns, uh, share the facts, be own, honest and open and be a role model. I mentioned if, if an adult actually uses tobacco or nicotine, be honest about that. Um, talk about the difficulty in quitting or, or how it makes you feel. Um, so young people see through a lot. If we exaggerate the facts or say, vaping is absolutely worse than smoking, you know, smoking is still the number one preventable cause of death, disease, and disability. So vaping isn't number one, so they're not gonna believe you, you know? But is it good to inhale chemicals? And we're seeing damage to lungs. We're seeing damage to heart. You know, we're seeing them, the mental health concerns. You know, so stick with what we know and, and tell them that. And that will have a lot more validity and in your talking points. And then after you can thank them, um, you can help them manage their stress or talk about peer pressure. And then you can keep the conversation going. So this is an ongoing conversation. And this is another resource I would love to share too, um, but the Truth Initiative, so our teens are getting their ads. I do not get their ads because they're targeted to the right population, but our teens are getting their ads and they have a really great um, fact sheet that says like, what if my child doesn't want to quit? And so they walk you through some activities to do with the young person to really say, um, you know, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, you know, do you think you'll still be vaping? And so it really goes through some great talking points if you're seeing that the young person in your life does not want to quit at this time. And if they are ready, we have a lot of programs out there. So the Truth Initiative has uh, their This Is Quitting campaign where a young person can text DITCH VAPE to 88709. 
Um, smoke free gov has a uh, specific tips for teens, which is a really great website. And then I really hope you go to livedatefreeva.org, our new website too, um, for those discussion guide and tips. So the last point I've had parents recently ask me about, um, how their youth are getting these products and what happens if they know that there's a place that is selling to underage youth. And so I've started including this slide too. Um, but, you know, obviously we hope that there are tobacco retailers are not selling to youth under the age of 21. Um, but we do know that that happens. Um, and so if you know of a place that is consistently selling or has sold, you can go onto ABC's website and there's a complaint form. So ABC oversees not just alcohol, but also tobacco and nicotine products from compliance checks. Um, so that's just something for you to be aware of. And then there's all of our information. I mentioned quit now for adults, live day free. And then if there's, um, you wanna get in touch with me or any of my colleagues, that's the Virginia Tobacco Control Program. Thank you so much. That was so much information. It was a lot. Really appreciate it. <laughs> that was great. Um, we're going to switch now to Mrs. Jarman. She's our middle school principal and she's joining us virtually tonight. And Mrs. Jarman is going to talk to us a little bit about how um, Powhatan County Public Schools deals with uh, students when we are aware that they are vaping um, at school. Uh, first, I just want to say, Sarah, that was amazing it was really good information and i've already written down notes of what i can include in a sunday message to parents okay. i think the resources at the end is really what we're looking for as a school and community so thank you this was very good for me um so one thing the schools have is um that is our biggest preventative we have um vape sensors in our bathroom and I have an app on my phone and every time the bait sensor goes off, it goes, the app, um, our SRO has it and all administration has it. It will tell us what bathroom and where to go to. So we can go to that bathroom, see what's going on, or at least see what students are in it. The other thing that has been extremely helpful is there are a lot of students that will go into the restroom because it's typically happening in the bathroom and see that it's happening, go back to class, tell their teacher. Now, by the time we arrive, some people, students might not be in there, but we can at least go to cameras and get the time and see who was in there. So once we have an idea that someone is vaping or um, the sensor has gone off, we are able to search students. So we will do a legal search, which includes their belongings and um, on them to a certain degree. We also have a wand that we can use. Some of the vapes do have metal. I will say, um, just like you, Sarah, the products are constantly changing and a lot of them are now plastic. So detection isn't coming up on that. So if we do find a vape on a student, um, our SRO takes the vape, um, writes down the information, and it is a suspension with parent notification. Um, if it is a second offense or third offense, then um, the SRO will charge the student with having a vape. Um, one thing we are looking at though, um, Ms. Wojcicki and I talked about this today, is having modules for students if they do um, have a vape at school. Um, once they come back that they need to complete the module for the education. Um, so we're just always asking students, like, if you see something, say something, let us know. I will say students are um, extremely bright and they know where to hide things um, where we where we can't search. Um, they they know how to blow the smoke somewhere like into you'll into their their sleeve so you can't see it. If they are in the bathroom, many times they'll be in the stall. Um, we do have teachers out on duty checking restrooms. So we're certainly looking for it. And uh, if we have any idea that it's happening, we do take it very seriously, extremely seriously. Um, but we really need help at home um, for parents to be looking for this stuff and checking them before they go to school. Um, I'm glad you showed them the different products. I had actually never seen the milk carton um, as 
as a vape or some of the um, drink bottles that you shared with us tonight. Um, I'm going to share that with my admin team because now I'm like, maybe there are things that we haven't even noticed or discovered that was a vape. So certainly take it seriously. And Katie, Ms. Wojcicki, I know that you're going to go into kind of education that we give with kids um, at the middle school and at different levels as, as, as well. Thank you, Mrs. Drummond. And um, we are in the process of um, adding the modules to the middle school. Currently, our high school students are assigned modules if they um, are receiving discipline for a tobacco vape. And um, on the third offense, the students are referred to court. So the, um, the SRO will, um, you know, Correct, uh, write them a summons and they will be um, referred to court. We do try to divert the court um, involvement when possible because these are young people and they are learning and we're trying to um, make sure that they have an opportunity to, to correct with their parents' input and involvement. Um, that's why we wait till the third offense. However, that's just for to tobacco vapes. And, and Sarah, thank you. That was so informative and so helpful. Um, and of course, you're focusing on tobacco, but I will say that there are uh, vape devices that also have many other substances. Um, one that we see most often is THC, uh, which is a marijuana related product. And so it is um, illegal in all um, capacities. And so that immediately is referred to the SRO. Um, so the diversion is only in the case that there is tobacco only. Um, all of the vapes, as um, Mrs. Drummond mentioned, are collected and turned over to the SRO. So they can um, actually have them for evidence, especially if it might be a case where there might have been um, THC in the vape. But um, they also then take the tobacco ones and they, they bag them. And we participate in the um, program that Sarah mentioned earlier through VCU where they are researching what is found in vapes. So um, we send them off to VCU to be studied because we wanna know so we can give you all the most um, up-to-date information about what kids are inhaling and what they're um, being exposed to when they are vaping. So um, now I'm going to share some information with you that Mrs. Woodson, our lead um, health and PE teacher put together. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here today, but I did wanna share with you how we educate students about um, vaping. And so, um, oh good, I was hoping it was up there. Um, so the first thing is that our students alternate between health class in an actual classroom and the gym for physical education um, about every two weeks in uh, middle school and high school. So when they're in the health classroom, they have a full health curriculum and um, substance use awareness and abuse um, is one of the topics that's discussed in their health class. And they do that for a two week unit in each grade from sixth grade through ninth grade. Um, we're also talking, similar to the conversation Mrs. Jarman and I had today, we're always looking to evolve and figure out more ways to educate our students. And what we found is looking at the number of sixth graders who have started experience, um, experimenting with vaping, that we really need to catch them earlier. So um, our next step is to look at presenting some of this information to fifth graders. And of course, we want some feedback on that from parents and we would give parents an opportunity to opt out if they didn't think it was appropriate um, since this is our first time thinking about providing that direct instruction to um, elementary students. We do talk about healthy choices, of course, and they talk about um, being careful about, you know, exposing yourself to things that you wouldn't want to be exposed to, but we don't specifically educate on the dangers of vaping uh, currently in fifth grade. So um, I'm going to go through and talk about the curriculum in each of the grade levels. And um, so in sixth grade, specifically, you can see the standards of learning that are covered in sixth grade. And um, one thing that they do, and they, they do all sorts of activities to make sure that it's interesting and exciting to the students. Um, and one thing that they're doing is they're looking at this um, Choices magazine. So it's sort of like a comic book style. And they um, talk about ways to resist um, vaping if 
you know, peer pressure kind of thing. And then also they talk about the dangers of vaping. Um, they also watch a prevention video that is um, a little bit more engaging than just listening to, you know, your teacher talk about it. But they have conversations around why vaping is dangerous and what are some of the things that they can do if someone invites them to vape. In seventh and eighth grade, um, there are more SOLs that are specifically addressing uh, vaping and the consequence of risky behaviors, including tobacco. So it's not just about tobacco. At that point, they're um, beginning to talk more about ways to um, have a drug-free lifestyle. So in seventh grade, we're starting to have a little bit more conversation around just all about different types of substances. And um, you can see the topics that are addressed through lots of different ways listed there on the right. Um, but essentially they start to, you know, sort of share the information that Sarah shared with us tonight about what you're actually exposing yourself to, um, what is it that you're inhaling and how addictive it can be. And um, just some of the myths of vaping, because some people will think that it's really not harmful. It's just uh, like literally vape. So they think of like water vapor, which always puzzles me because why would you want to inhale water into your lungs either? But, you know, they, they don't think of it as being harmful. So um, they um, try to educate them on the truth about vaping. And that's in both seventh and eighth grade. And then in ninth grade, we do use the, the Know the Truth um, curriculum. And they go through and they talk a lot about how students can live a um, vape-free life. And um, this curriculum has um, the This is Quitting which is a it is similar to what you described earlier, the text message that um, will help the students to be able to uh, to quit. And here are the standards of learning for the ninth grade curriculum. Um, and so at this point, we're really talking a lot about the actual effect on the brain and how it um, you know can be a lifelong habit. And they also tie it into financial um, implications because if you look at how much it costs to purchase a vape over time, how much of your, you know, if you're a high school student and you're working an hourly job and you're having, you know, a certain amount of um, disposable income, then how, how much of that is being spent on your vapes? And at a certain point, you don't even want it anymore. But as Sarah said, the addiction sort of takes over. And one thing that we have seen at school since COVID really is the prevalence of students who truly are addicted to nicotine. Um, they really, just as the article describes, they have a hard time learning. Um, and a lot of that, you know, came about, unfortunately, kids were um, a lot of times left home, you know, with their parents who were going into work, they spent a lot of time on their own, they might have had additional stress, or they definitely had a diff additional stress uh, due to the pandemic. And so we saw a lot of kids come back to school after the pandemic, having gotten more um, addicted to tobacco and nicotine than what um, we had previously seen. And so we really have, um, even though it's started to decline in the statistics, we still continue to see a large number of students who um, seek out vaping or throughout their school day. Um, and then the last slide I have is the examples of ninth grade lessons. And again, they're um, trying to work on education. So they're designing a vaping awareness brochure and um, advertising how addictive um, nicotine can be. And so our goal as educators is to make sure that kids have the facts and that kids know um, what they can do to avoid it. And if they are vaping, what they can do to try and stop. Um, but as I said, we're trying to enhance our um, curriculum and offer more instruction in fifth grade. And I'm sorry, I was supposed to say this last part. Mrs. Woodson gave me, gave me notes. Um, the, the last part is that we are looking at adding more into 10th um, 10th grade health class as well, because similar to our fifth graders, we felt like we weren't getting them early enough. With our 10th graders, brain has developed a little bit more, so maybe we'd be able to um, provide a little bit more instruction around the dangers and a little heavier on how to um, stop vaping if you've already started. Um, our 11th and 12th graders don't have health and PE as a elective um, anymore because they've met their graduation requirements. Some, some 
students do choose to um, continue in health and PE, but um, we would like to find ways to create school-wide activities to enhance, um, you know, just to keep the message out there for all of the students. So at this point, we have um, gone through all of the prepared slides. And so we wanna open it up for questions if any of you have some. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so just for those of you at home, the question is, um, is the curriculum consistent across the county and are we aligned with um, what other divisions around us are doing? And uh, with the comment that it, it seems a little late to start even in fifth grade. Um, did I summarize? Okay, just wanna make sure I've restated it. Um, this is uh, based on the standards of learning that um, are you know obviously state standards. Um, and I don't know, and I apologize, this is where it would be really nice if Mrs. Woodson was here, if um, we had, you know, if there are um, other counties that start younger um, but I can get you that information and get back to you. I agree. I mean, we start with healthy choices in kindergarten as far as diet, as far as exercise, as far as just taking care of your body. Um, and that goes all the, you know, obviously from a very early age. Um, I don't believe that they ignore it, but it's not a specific point of uh, emphasis until sixth grade currently with the idea of adding it to fifth grade. So a lot of that's in front and maybe sometimes they're not having a lot of trust in the adults first. I agree. And I'm not gonna be able to <laughs> recap all of that. But um uh, Mr. Durrett, are are the questions from the audience being able to be heard over fair. Okay. I won't try to recap then. Okay, did you have any insight into that, Sarah? I, I will say that we, uh, because I'm regional, so I work with 30 counties and cities, um, you know, this is pretty typical for what other counties are doing as well, but I have been getting, and that's interesting that you mentioned that it seems like, even though nationally we've seen the rates go down, is that the case? we're getting a lot more calls from schools. And so it's not just here that this is a concern or that it seems like there are more young people using. And then we've also heard that there are some elementary kids, school kids coming with vapes to some, in some surrounding counties. Um, and so they're like, what do we do? Or we're not gonna give them, you know, uh, live vape free necessarily, but there are a lot of talking points and there's a lot of great opportunities, especially for parents to have those conversations. And a lot of those same skills of, um, you know, taking care of your body, being healthy, that's really what, you know, those little kids want to hear and need to hear. But then also, you know, have you seen anyone vaping? Have you, do you know what that is? You know, there are more examples of it on TV shows and in movies. And so, you know, as, Parents just having that conversation and talking about how it can harm your body is really important. And most likely those little ones are getting it from an older sibling's dresser or backpack or a parent may use a device and bringing it in. It's less likely they're using it consistently like we're seeing in middle and high school, um, but it is still a learning opportunity, a concern. And I, it's great that you all are addressing it younger and younger and then you know have conversations with your friends too and and just having those conversations getting comfortable with your your child you know going for long walks in the car and bringing it up over and over is really like the evidence is there and how much of a difference that can make with their choices yes ma'am 
there um, to you know, students that can catch with the base versus like they tell you they're buying it from another student. Um, you know, do you, do you need to catch a child with the base on their person or if you're hearing that other children are buying it from another student or a student is getting it from a, a store or something, are you, I'm, I'm assuming you work with the sheriff's office to stop that, but how, how does it work? What are the consequences to, to students selling bait to other students? Good question. I'm not sure if Ms. Jarman was able to stay on because I know she did have another commitment, but I will. Um... No, I'm, I'm here, but oh. it is very hard to hear um, okay. what so, the audience is asking. Okay, so I will attempt to restate. Feel free to jump <laughs> in. If, um, what um, is being asked is how does it compare when a student is um, distributing the vape products or selling the vape products to another student at school as opposed to a student who just simply has a vape um, and what are the consequences for those students and then also the question was do we have to physically catch the student with it or you know if we have information that the student is vaping um, what would we do in that case Okay, so in terms of if it's distribution, that is an out of school suspension and it is a higher suspension than just having a vape. Um, if you look at our students' rights and responsibilities, there are different levels and those levels depend on the consequence. A distribution has a higher level, therefore there is a higher consequence. As far as discipline, if we cannot find a vape, on a child, no, we cannot discipline. What we will do though is call the parent and give them the information we had and <clears throat> share that with them in hopes that they will look at home, talk to their child. Because um, again, they're getting very smart about where, where to put things. So we have to have evidence to discipline. Did I answer all of that question? Katie? One second. Oh. Yes, so the question, and I can I can take this one. The the, the third question is, if we're aware that in a location in the county or locally is um, selling products to um, underage kids, do we work with the sheriff's office um, or what do we do in those cases? And absolutely 100% yes. Um, Sergeant Kelly is our um, lead SRO and he can tell you that I will blow up his phone telling him, we heard that this happened in this place and this happened in that place. and um, you know, he does, he takes it from there. So um, I couldn't speak directly to what would happen as a result of that, but um, we certainly do work with our partners in the sheriff's office and, and they take it extremely seriously. Um, and, I, and I failed to mention the second consequence of, of the second um, incident. So the first incident, the SRO is aware and they collect the vape. The second incident, the SRO actually speaks with the student about the fact that it's illegal, that they are, you know, because for all of our students, it's illegal. We don't have students who are 21, so they're all illegal if they have it. Um, and they take the time to explain to them consequences. They take the time to explain. So it's not just coming from the school again. It's not just coming from their parent. It's coming from someone in a position of authority. And they explain what could happen if they end up having to go to court. Um, they also take the time to talk with parents. So parents have that same information um, when their child's involved. And then it's that's why when they get to that third offense, I mean, they've really been sufficiently warned by school, given the benefit of the doubt by the SRO, and then um, it gets to that third level. And again, with anything THC related, it is immediately um, a referral. And, and at that point, they are referred to court as well. Uh, Mr. Jiggy. Yes, ma'am. I just I just wanted to jump in to actually today um, we had a parent call us after school to let us know that she had some information 
about a place that was selling vapes um, to underage students. And within a minute of getting off the phone, our SRO was contacted about that. Did you want to add? I just wanted to say that I'm I'm really glad that you all are also giving you know cessation resources. You've talked about the modules, talking to the parents because these products have been designed to be addictive. So if a young person has tried it and uses it a couple times and then is continuing to use it, that's not just because they're being rebellious, you know, and so really helping them to get off that is is just really great. So I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm glad to hear that part of your policy. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so the question is who's making these products, who's producing them, and who's marketing them? And so there's not a, a super easy answer to that, but I will say a lot of the big tobacco companies do have the products as well. Um, and so that is a very kind of different <laughs> um, organization that, you know, perhaps is, is, applying to FDA to try to get their products sold legally um, and trying to kind of go down those channels because they have a lot of money and big production and things like that. Um, but then, especially when we saw these loopholes, like I mentioned, all of a sudden Puff Bar became really popular. Um, not just that, then there became fake Puff Bars. So those came from China and it got so bad that Puff Bar even had a website where you could type in the code on your box to find out if it's a real puff bar or if it's a puff bar fake. Um, and so a lot of those products, like the ones today that we saw FDA saying that those juice boxes and drink lookalikes, I had never seen those either, um, but they are supposedly out there. It's just companies are just pumping them. They come from out, you know, overseas. Um, and so it's really catch up to say like, you can't sell those. And then even then, if the products are already in a store, the store may continue to sell them because FDA is working with the manufacturer. So it's really complicated. And in Virginia, we don't have a, um, a, a lot of compliance checks. We don't have a tobacco retail license. We're only one of eight or nine states that do not have a tobacco retail license. That would make it easier to know where these products are being sold. And then also it would say, if you're selling to someone underage, we will take away your tobacco license, you know? Um, so it would give something, uh, some oversight to that, to the selling too. So it's not a real clear answer. And then the marketing, I mean, these companies, Juul, there's a, a huge Juul settlement, settlement because they were marketing to young people. They were using influencers. They were really, they were in schools. They were in schools and talking about their products. Um, and so, they have been fine for that. Um, but then a lot of these other products also use influencers, TikToks, just trying to get word out, um, product placement, you know, lots of different ways. And in the past, um, we have offered a program through um, the high school um, in conjunction with one of our clubs, um, Students Against Destructive Decision Making. Um, and they have, um, it's called Hidden in Plain Sight. And so essentially it's a mock bedroom that they set up and um, we, the parents are invited to come into the, the room and see, you know, what might look like a thumb drive and actually it's a vape or, you know, various and sundry items that are used to disguise um, things that their children shouldn't be having. So whether it be, um, any, well, any type of Ill illegal drug in that in that case. So um, I guess I'm asking those of you in the room, would that be something that you would be interested in us offering again? Um, I see a couple of heads shaking. Okay. Um, because it's been a few years since we've done that um, and we'd be definitely willing to do that um, in the spring. It takes a little time to set it up, but yeah, we can, we can arrange that for the spring. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Did any come in online? No. Okay, good. Well, yeah. 
Okay. Well, on that note, I would love to um, say thank you very much, Sarah, for yeah. being here tonight. And um, thank you to Aaron Woodson for putting together the slides on the uh, curriculum. And thank you, Ms. German, for being here tonight to talk about student discipline and consequences. Um, and if anyone has any questions moving forward, please feel free to reach out. I don't think I ever introduced myself. I'm Katie Wojcicki, I'm the Director of Student Services. And uh, I wanna say thank you to Mr. Durrett for being here tonight to take care of streaming and to Ms. Sarkis tonight for helping us with our technology. Um, thank you so much to everybody for being here tonight. And um, on behalf of the School Health Advisory Committee that I also neglected to say sponsored this evening, um, thank you so much for all of you um, for your participation. I feel like I should like 